This year's State of the City is an interactive presentation. At this time, I encourage you to turn on your cell phones and await further instruction from Mayor Condon. So those of you who've been at the State of the City addresses in the past um, know the drill. So, uh, so he will certainly walk you through this. With regard to Mayor Condon, I've known him and his family for quite some time. He was born the same year that Spokane was preparing to shine on the global stage at Expo 74. Mayor David Condon grew up in a community that was safe for families, fertile for businesses, and naturally stunning. After David graduated from Gonzaga Prep, he went on to earn his bachelor's degree in finance and military science from Boston College. The first re-elected mayor in, more, in Spokane in more than 40 years, Mayor Condon remains focused on many key initiatives which began during his first term, all aimed at making Spokane safer, smarter, and healthier. These investments include public safety, growing jobs in our economy, promoting a successful budget, improving Spokane's infrastructure, and increasing the quality of life. And I know just recently, both the mayor and council president presented to our board about a very aggressive uh, capital investment um, uh, and infrastructure investment that the city is going to be making that all of us are going to see and be witnessing here in the next few years. Prior to becoming mayor of the second largest city in Washington, Mayor Condon's distinguished professional career included serving in the United States Army, owning and operating small businesses, and serving as the senior staff in the U.S. House of Representatives. David and his wife, Kristen, are thrilled to be raising their three children near many of their family members here in Spokane, which was recently named an All-American City for the third time. He is committed to making sure Spokane grows and remains the city of choice. Please join me at this time in welcoming Mayor David Condon to the stage. As we begin today, I want you to think about your typical week. Think about what you see when you leave your house, what you pass on your way to work, school, recreation, dining, and entertainment what you see on television and social media, read in the paper or hear on the radio, what you see along the river that runs through our city. What I hope you see, I hope you see progress, better streets, improved access to recreation, more responsive and adaptive public safety, a more vibrant neighborhood, and a thriving community. Thank you, and good afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to continue our conversation about Spokane. A group of Spokane Public School students have joined us today right over here, and we're happy that you're with us. We're also pleased to welcome those of you that are watching at home and those at gatherings at City Hall, local high schools, our library branches, and Washington State University. We've been taking your, take, uh, talking with you over the last six years now. And each year, we've been fortunate enough to report on great progress and discuss exciting new opportunities for Spokane, our neighborhoods, our youth, our most vulnerable, and all of you. For the first few years, progress was measured by improvements in city finances and realigning our resources to better meet our citizens' priorities. That evolved to delivering bigger outcomes in public safety, in our streets, and river cleanup. Today, we're talking about transformational ideas and initiatives and investments that are enhancing our quality of life, accelerating new investment in Spokane, and expanding the possibilities for future generations. Spokane is on the verge of an amazing opportunity, unprecedented levels of investment in our city, a renewed energy give us chance to really set us apart. Think about it. What other city shares a view of Nordstrom's an AMC theater with the river and the falls. Where else can you walk out of your office in a downtown building in less than five minutes be on a paved or a natural trail that connects you to the largest urban state park? How many other places can offer you an ice ribbon, major college basketball, skiing, snowshoeing, and hiking at the largest state park and a symphony in a world-class setting all in one weekend? Oh, and when you're hungry? How about your choice of venues that overlook the Upper Falls, the city skyline, or the Great Gorge River Valley in one of the top six small cities for food lovers, according to the Wall Street Journal? Or how about a drink of the second best craft vodka distillery in the country 
according to USA Today. And we've not even begun to talk about the 4,100 acres of city green space and trails, including 87 parks, the new investment planned along the river, or the community's commitment to get to a cleaner river faster, the genesis of much of Spokane's recent progress. By now, you should start getting closer in the feel about the Spokane's urban experience. Our story is one of natural beauty and sustainability, opportunity and partnership, healthcare and education, community and neighborhood. But before we do and get to all of that, a few quick facts for the data nerds out there like me. Over the past six years, more than $2.4 billion has been invested in Spokane in the form of public and private projects. That includes the two largest years ever. Household names like Nike, Urban Outfitter, Carhartt, and Pendleton Wool, and the introduction of two new medical schools making Spokane the only city in the state that can make that claim. Meeting household income, an important measure of the economic vitality, has also climbed significantly and for the third year in a row has reached its highest level in more than 10 years. Growing household income means more money for families to spend on wants rather than worrying exclusively about covering needs. And all of this great news for Spokane, it absolutely is. And we should be very, very proud of the progress because it is significant. Oftentimes, progress does reveal opportunities, and that's the case here too. At $45,676, median household income still falls short of the approximately $54,000 two independent studies have found necessary for a family to afford to live in Spokane. We offer that data as an important context to where we've been and push that we still need to make for new opportunities to grow jobs and economic vitality as we continue to build the city of choice. That means driving greater certainty and resources to encourage investment that generates new and advancing employment opportunities and builds depth in our workforce. You told us unequivocally that the city government has an important role in driving jobs and economic growth. We drive that catalytic investment that in many different ways in making sure that we're financially stable. We include developing critical infrastructure that jumpstarts private investment, making strategic investments in workforce and people, streamlining government regulation and producing greater, greater certainty for job creators like all of you. As a city organization, we've talked a lot about the quality of life and what it means. Is it a safe and healthy community? Does that include infrastructure investments? How does the sustainability of public resources factor? What about the really cool stuff? All of these questions are important to the conversation and the city significantly influences all of the answers, which of course shape the story we have to tell here at home and to those that we're encouraging to invest here. They are what sets us apart from every other community. This is where our story really begins and why our river is at the epicenter of it all. If you think back to Spokane's very early days, the river was the center of trade and commerce for our tribes. It was a place to meet and congregate, a place for deals and discussions, a place that gave Spokane identity. By the 1940s, the riverbank had become an industrial rail hub and also of commerce. 30 years later, it had fallen into disrepair that minimized the, city's, the river's impact and the importance to our community. It wasn't until we invited the world to visit in 1974 that Spokane went yet under another transformation that began to put the river back at center stage. Today, Today, we're experiencing the next evolution of a river that's once again firmly implanted as Spokane's identity and has spawned thinking that has given us much of our recent innovation. As we sit in this room, we're at the eastern edge of a park undergoing its first significant investment in more than 40 years. New attractions like the ribbon are drawing people back into the park, onto the ice for maybe the first time in years and forging new experiences and memories. In just a, sh a few short months, the Luth Carousel will reopen in a brand new building that will include spaces for gathering and celebration. Improvements to the pavilion and playground, event and green spaces will follow in the middle and the north side of Riverfront Spokane, establishing a very walkable connection to the neighborhoods on both sides of the river. 
But the real value of the investment made by the city's voters is the energy and the enthusiasm it sparked that is generating transformational momentum far beyond the Riverside neighborhood. Private development is happening on both sides also. The city announced over the holidays a community investment plan to add $52 million around the city, including major projects that would expand the boundaries and impact of the park well beyond the downtown core. The western edge of the park, which has seen great investment from a vista in the gathering place in Huntington Park, has effectively expanded to Monroe Street and dramatically improved river access. Part of the city's $52 million investment would stretch those boundaries even further to the west, west of Glover Field and the Sanford Bridge to include a great river gorge and a new three-mile loop trail connecting Peaceful Valley and the west central neighborhoods. A potential zip line from the new trailhead overlook at the top of a new wastewater overflow tank outside the Spokane Downtown Public Library would take you on the new river experience along that line underneath the Monroe Street Bridge to Glover Field. Another trailhead directly across from the river, also based on major investments in storm and wastewater management and river cleanup, would be a second entry point to the loop for users on foot or wheels and directly connect the commercial, retail, and entertainment areas to the recreational experiences in the Northwest neighborhoods and to the University District. From the Ben Burr Trail to the Bluff, to the pedestrian bridge that will become the newest landmark on the eastern end of the city, enhancements to the city's bicycle network are connecting riders and neighborhoods around the city. Last fall, you all told us overwhelmingly that the city government should work with the school district to invest in opportunities for youth. Partnerships with the county, schools, libraries, the facilities district, and the sports commission are leveraging that momentum with a plan which would expand educational and recreational opportunities for youth with new schools, libraries, and fields in our neighborhoods around the city. Those investments will be a new chapter in the Spokane story. This, this is our urban edge. Our story is about a 100-acre park that lets people quickly transition from the hustle and bustle of a thriving regional economic center in the heart of the Intermountain Northwest into an oasis of recreation and relaxation in a matter of minutes. It's about a river that invites people to experience the outdoors through the lens of a camera, the calm of a leisurely walk on a sunny afternoon, or the intensity of a long run or a bike ride. It is the draw of a symphony in an off-Broadway series and a dinner overlooking the river in the falls. It's turning a library into a late-night talk show venue to showcase arts and entertainment in a space called The Lens, and a city that has been named among the hippest in the country by two separate publications. Our urban experience is about calling home a place that has first-rate schools, improved roads, more responsive public safety, and healthy, affordable neighborhoods, and is launching an effort to lead the conversation about being a welcoming community at a time of so much unrest nationally. It is the story of a city found more than 100 years ago, but in many ways is still just now being discovered. The city has placed a great deal of time and energy and resources in speeding up that discovery process and advancing the economic vitality of the capital of the Intermountain Northwest. The timing is critical to capitalize on the momentum so that Spokane can take the next step as a healthy, economically prosperous leader and an exceptional quality of life for all. That begins with our story, how we tell it and who hears it. A couple years ago, GSI put together a competitiveness report. The report card called out 10 fundamental factors, including sustainability, location, transportation, real estate, utilities and infrastructure, permitting and regulatory environment, business climate, and incentives. The presentation was eye-opening for us at the city. We realized that as a city government, we directly influenced all those factors, which started a discussion about how we better support economic development and grow economic vitality. Maybe the city was not doing enough. What more could we be doing? Or, more to the point, what more should we be doing? By now, most of you are familiar with the first ever joint administration city council strategic plan that resulted from a year of self-evaluation and brainstorming and finally focused in four areas of influence, safe and healthy, innovative infrastructure, sustainable resources, and of course, 
urban experience. Council President Ben Stuckert is with us today and along with the rest of the council has been a key leader in moving the plan forward towards a common vision we all share for our city, Spokane. I will spare you the blow by blow details, but suffice it to say, like any good strategic pro planning process, we gathered city leadership in a room adorned with flip charts and PowerPoint. We engaged our employees and our citizens, went through a series of prioritization exercises, selected initiative leaders, and drafted a work plan. Rest assured that our work plan is filled with the good government walk, wonk stuff you would expect. Things like infrastructure improvements, response times, criminal justice reform, and sustainability. All good municipal government nuts and bolts. But the more we looked at the work plan, the more we realized it's about creating and growing and maintaining an urban experience that we are proud of and others want to be a part of from visitors, employees, and employers. That means drivable streets and safe neighborhoods, getting the help you need when you need it, when seconds matter, places to spend time with family and friends exploring our city, an end to the troubling cycle of property crime and homelessness, and leaving our city better than we found it for future generations to enjoy. Neighborhood and community, safety and security, opportunity and stability, these are the things people desire most. You want to know that you and your family can build a happy, fulfilling life in a place that takes care of its most precious resources, human, natural, and man-made, and that it will continue to grow and prosper for future generations. In Spokane, it starts with our river our greatest natural asset. We're nearing the completion of a $350 million investment that's getting us to a cleaner river faster and earned us the North American Clean Water Award for our commitment to Americans' waters ways. It was about protecting the river, cleaning it up, and inviting us back into it. We all know the benefits of cleaning up the river's ecosystem. But beyond the environmental responsibility, focusing on the river pointed us toward an outcome. That outcome was to celebrate and return a multi-generational asset to its pristine glory for the people who live here and visit our city. It was to ride on top of the river on paddle boards and kayaks and canoes, or next to it on bikes and skates and longboards, to take pictures with loved ones, renewed acquaintances, or simply gaze at the power and beauty of rushing water. It was the return to the river as a proud centerpiece of our community with so much to offer families, businesses, and guests just like it used to be. An important lesson emerged from the pursuit of that outcome. We learned the old adage about the sum of the parts being greater than the whole applies not only to government and also to government agencies. As must, most of you know by now, we paired utilities and streets and parks resources to get to a cleaner river faster. That investment removed contaminants from the river and returned streets and park improvements all for the same dollar invested while completing the utility project for about 30% cheaper. The first integrated solution set in motion a ripple effect that is impacting city services throughout the organization. For the first time, we began to think in a big way about integration outside the organization. We turned to our partners in Spokane County, we, our partners at Spokane Public Schools, Spokane International Airport, social service and healthcare providers, higher education and the business community. The benefits are in the places that matter most, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, and playgrounds. We applied the same integrated thinking to better handling of non-emergency medical calls. Now when you call for help, a small vehicle may show up for a non-emergency medical need. People who require a lower level, le level of care than an emergency room visit are offered a ride in a van to a clinic rather than an ambulance to a hospital. Both of those alternatives save the system money, free up valuable resources for responding more quickly, and with the right services to medical and fire emergencies, and provide the person requesting help with the best level of care to meet their individual need. Police officers are working with youth to break down barriers and receiving specialized training in crisis intervention and handling unique health conditions. They're using data to work with other local, state, and federal agencies to target hotspots for crime, focusing on the most prolific offenders to drive down our vehicle thefts and vi visiting domestic violence offenders in jail to end the cycle of abuse. People outside, people outside the city, they're paying attention to what our police department is doing. 
The New York Times recently held out the Spokane Police Department as a model agency following the collaborative reform work we did to reinvent ourselves as a more responsive organization that is closer to the citizens it serves. That work alone, while massive and progressive, is not enough to, for, to tackle the city's property crime challenge. Criminal justice reform work with Spokane County is achieving greater efficiencies and better outcomes with how we evaluate, rehabilitate, and supervise offenders to end the frustrating cycle of repeatedly arresting the same offenders. We reached across the city organization to establish a one-click, one-call, one-visit My Spokane 311 Customer Service Center. Outside of the organization, we're working closer with 211 to better connect people to human services. This past summer, Spokane was the leader in a youth homelessness challenge that connected our city resources with communities from around the state to share ideas and innovations to make sure that we can get teens and young adults back into safety and structure of a stable housing environment. The city also increased its investment in 24-7 shelter system run by local service providers and their, their agencies that offer a safe, warm place for everyone and helps transition men, women, family, and youth to permanent housing solutions. Goodwill Industries, the Downtown Spokane Partnership, the Spokane Transit Authority, the Spokane International Airport, each answered our call and said, how can we help when we approach them about supporting Give Real Change and Hope Works? The initiatives engage the community in supporting the needs of our most vulnerable with funding important services and work experience opportunities intended to better meet the underlying issues causing homelessness. For more on this amazing program, let's watch a video from City Cable 5. You've seen people holding signs on our streets that say they'd be willing to work. Well, coming early next year, these folks are going to get their chance. This program will give individuals who are panhandling the opportunity to experience the dignity of work and begin the process of better their own lives. The pilot project is called Hope Works, and it's a new joint approach by several nonprofit and civic agencies designed to help homeless or unemployed people looking for a new life off of Spokane streets. At the end of the day, these individuals will be provided a stipend and probably most importantly, information about employment services, treatment, emergency shelters, and housing. Goodwill extended those services to Jason after an ankle injury ended his construction career. I was really didn't want to ask for help, but they made it so easy that I just wanted to do more. Goodwill helped Jason land a job at Kodiak Security while he finishes up college. There's life-changing opportunities that are available at Goodwill. And so the Hope Works program can also change the lives of the people we see out there panhandling. Well, to provide me with laundry money, uh, a little bit of uh, pocket money for all the bus, food. A similar program in Albuquerque called There's a Better Way has already ended the cycle of homelessness for more than 20 people. Ask Spokane's panhandlers if they're willing to work, and here's what they have to say. You know, I can bust my butt for that. I'm physically healthy and capable of doing something. So if you'd like to support the Hope Works Project, text CHANGE to 50555 to donate $5 or donate to the Hope Works Spokane campaign at GoFundMe.com. Partnerships led by Spokane Public Schools, Spokane Public Facilities District, and the Sports Commission that include the Spokane Public Library, the Spokane Public uh, Parks Department, and the city are formulating a youth initiative that maximizes public resources to deliver better re educational and recreational opportunities more efficiently and cost effectively. The conversation includes new middle schools, library space, more fields at Dwight Merkel Complex, and a stadium solution to re-energize high school sports in our downtown. On the north bank of the river, construction uh, could begin as soon as a field house, as a, for a field house, for uh, as a venue for ice and court and other indoor sports, is a partnership the Public Facilities District, the Spokane County, the Hotel Motel Association, the Sports Commission, Spokane Park, uh, Parks Department, and the city. We're also talking about building a Northwest Gateway to Riverfront Park with new recreational opportunities and a new post street bridge that ties those amenities to the rest of the park. 
Improvements to the city's gateways at the freeway off-ramps are welcoming visitors to Spokane and introducing them to our story of our city from our tribal fishing grounds and the industrial and electrical might to a nationally acclaimed craft brewing industry. Spokane County, Spokane International Airport, and the city have put together for the first of its kind collaborative economic development initiative on the West Plains to drive new investment in manufacturing and aerospace and logistics. The initiative builds off of the success of a record year for passenger and cargo volume at a travel-friendly airport that has grown to 16 non-stops nationwide de destinations. Urbanova, a smart city initiative that includes Washington State University, Avista, ITRON, McKinstry, the University District, and the city as founding partners is gaining national attention as an innovative way to combine private utilities, higher education, and city government to study better ways to deliver important services using data garnered from things like light level, air quality, and shared energy resources in the University District. Spokane Gives, which connects service providers with needs to those willing to help, will take place again this April for the fifth year. The initiative has already attracted 51,000 volunteers who've given over $6.5 million in, uh, in volunteer impact in the city of Spokane. Those volunteers are the reason why Spokane was the only city ever recognized by the Friends of National Service Organization in Washington, D.C. Community Court, which connects low-level, non-violent offenders to social service resources to address the underlying issues such as drug addiction, homelessness, and unemployment in the downtown library, expanded to its second location in the Northeast Community Center. Fix It Fest, a pilot program to speed up street improvements, applied an additional million dollars and new ideas to enhance the driving experience in West Hills, Emerson Garfield, and East Central neighborhoods this last year while at the same time having back-to-back -back -ama amazing construction season. Next year, the program will expand to Lincoln Heights, East Central, Southgate, Nevada Heights, Cliff Cannon, Northwest, Logan, Audubon, and River, Downriver, Comstock, and Chief Gary Park neighborhoods. Connectivity has also been important to enhancing our residential and our business areas. The completion of the Barnes, Street, or the Barnes Road connection on Indian Trail and Five Mile and improved public safety response times in both neighborhoods by 50%. Significant improvements to the street, sidewalk, and transit access along East Sprague Corridor and similar enhancements that will happen this year at North Monroe are solidifying the connections in those important business districts and teaching us valuable lessons about how we best engage with neighborhoods and business owners to lessen the impact of construction. To add depth to our workforce, we've worked with the Associated General Contractors on its successful Head Start to Construction Trade program to provide occupational training that could lead to careers in the trades. Some of those graduates have already found employment with local contractors and are working on projects right here in Spokane, including the Louvre Carousel. Let's hear about one of those program graduates. It's been a long climb for Melissa Halverson. Three months ago, the single parent mom didn't know the difference between a scissor lift and scaffolding. Now, Melissa is putting the finishing touches on the carousel rotunda. It makes me feel great and I just love it. I really like this job, you know, there's still a lot for me to learn, but I've learned a lot and I enjoy it. We first met Melissa last October when she was enrolled in this class that teaches students what it takes to make a living in construction. Melissa took the course, hoping to shore up a better future for her family. So I have two children and over the past decade I've been working in the business field or sales and no matter what I was doing I could never get above the poverty level because I don't have a bachelor's degree. So Melissa signed up for the Head Start to the Construction Trades Training Program, a free six-week class that teaches the basics about how to build things. We develop six areas, and so that's physical, mental, emotional control, intuition, skills, trades, and then spirit, so an unconquerable spirit. That spirit led to Melissa graduating from the Head Start program along with her fellow female students nicknamed the Magnificent Seven. Are you impressed with the changes that you've seen in your daughter because of the class? Oh, absolutely, yes. This has been an amazing six weeks. And now it's time for Melissa's daughters to be impressed as well because their mom is helping to build a new Spokane landmark. She's doing really good, comes to work with a positive attitude. 
Uh, really looking forward to learn every day. Uh, she's getting along with everybody uh, on the job. It's a job taping and mudding drywall, but earning Melissa the biggest paychecks of her life. I was really excited to raise my kids here in Spokane and then share Riverfront Park with them in the carousel. In fact, these are pictures of Malika and Natea on the carousel long before the park's makeover. Now, taking a ride on the loof will be even more special for Melissa's family. Riverfront Park is pretty much the heart of Spokane, in my opinion, so I feel great that I got to be a part of it. And as long as this building stands, I can walk in here and look up and think of things that I've done here. Because Head Start training helps put people to work, the program is supported by grants and donations from the city of Spokane. The class has a 65% job placement rate, and Melissa is glad to be one of AGC's graduates. Melissa is here with us uh, today with her daughter, and they are the human side of meeting household income data we discussed earlier. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And quite literally, thank you for building the city of choice. As a city organization, we've reached across divisions to welcome, to become one of the few, very few governments in the world, if not the only one to produce more green energy than we consume. An emphasis on increased efficiency in the renewable energy produced by the steam at the waste energy plant and the hydropower from the upriver dam has gotten us there even as we continue to talk quarterly about ideas to make both assets more productive. All of the momentum is allowing us to have conversation about bumping the city's credit rating from already quite good to great. These innovations are part of a very core of Spokane a community that has grown up along the banks of the Spokane River that has taught us so much. In just the past few years, we've reestablished a close connection to the river. Now we've begun to rethink how we market our city as a place for businesses to grow and expand, a community for people who grew up in Spokane to return home to opportunities and a city that visitors want to come back to. As we look back over the past few years and ahead to the next couple, we're excited by all this momentum. There is a buzz about Spokane everywhere we visit, whether it's in our neighborhoods, across the mountains in Seattle, or all other parts of our country. People want to know what's going on in Spokane. How are we doing it? And more importantly, what's next? So we tell them, Spokane is a place that's being discovered. Spokane has so many examples that it's impossible to touch on them all. And you will no doubt have your own list which is why we started our time today by thinking about what you see from your front yard, on your street, in your neighborhood, and in the travels you have around the city. The ones that are top of mind for me make Spokane safer. They make us smarter. They make us healthier. They help people achieve their dreams, improve the value of our city, and build community. As we take the next step in telling the city's story, we want to hear from you. We would like to know what makes Spokane the place that has, has everybody talking. So, like Todd told you, if you would, please pull out your phones. Tell us. Join the digital conversation. Text Mayor Condon to 22333. Again, that's Mayor Condon at 22333. Tell us at 22333 your favorite things about Spokane. Tell us, again, at 22. 333, what makes Spokane safe and healthy, innovative and sustainable? Tell us at 22333 what defines your urban experience. We want to know. We need to know. The city does not own the message, and we are not the only storyteller. In fact, if we do it right, Spokane's story amplifies what is already being done to market our region. Our vision is that you help us tell the Spokane story by customizing it with your own examples, your own experiences and enthusiasm. Keep those responses coming as we take a look at what all of you guys are thinking. Amazing. Look at all those. Things that set Spokane apart. We've been talking for about 30 minutes now and barely scratched the surface on Spokane's story. You see, that is the beauty of our story. There's some very distinct common threads, but it's also very unique 
and it's individual to each of us. There really is something for everyone, and that's the point. You know, that is what we're willing that we will be amplifying through our storytelling effort. One thread we want to introduce you to today is a new effort I referenced a few minutes ago. It's an idea that focuses on who we are as a community rather than what we're not. And it defines us as individuals and as a collective. We hear it all the time from people who visit our city. They say everyone in Spokane is so friendly. Complete strangers smile, they wave, they say hello. They say, I feel so welcome here. We see it in the times of need, how our community comes together and rallies around neighbors, whether they know them or want to get to know them. They lift others up in times of loss or hate. We feel it in the brace of a community that is Spokind. This is not a city initiative. It's a community movement as just one organization that has worked with many, many individuals, businesses, and agencies. We have the pleasure of introducing Spokind on behalf of the community collective that has spent the better part of a year working on it. Spokind is the start of a community conversation about who we are and what we stand for. It will elevate the willingness of a community to embrace others and to be inclusive and welcoming every day. Today, on behalf of the Spokind Community Collective, we're issuing a challenge. Over the next week, we're asking you to show us your Spokind. Let's kick off that challenge by getting your phones back out to get you thinking about Spokind. So we've put together a collage of photos that shows Spokind. We'd like you to vote on the one that strikes you most by texting us at 22333. Again, send them to 22333. You'll see the choices up on the screen. Keep your Spokind going this week on social media by photographing an act of kindness, a simple smile, a friendly conversation, a warm embrace. After today, all you'll need to do to get involved is attach the hashtag Spokind and post it on social media. Make it part of your Facebook story, post it to Instagram, tweet it. However you communicate on social networks, show us your Spokind during a week that's associated with love and kindness. We'd also like your help spreading the word the old-fashioned way, face-to-face. -face. At your place settings, you should each see a two double-sided Spokane cards to pass along. One side introduces people to Spokine. The other side is a way for you to recognize an individual caught in the act of being Spokine. Please also pass the cards out over the next week and recognize a moment of kindness. Spokane does not have to look very far to show its Spokine. It's ingrained in our nature and part of our story. In closing today, we need to acknowledge a few people that helped us put this program together and starting our Spokane story. First, a big thank you to DH for all the work you did with the Community Spokane Project. DH is one of about two dozen organizations that has been meeting for the better part of a year to find a way to lead the Spokane conversation. Thank you to the Spokane Police Chaplain Ed Hoffman for the beautiful invocation. We also need to recognize David Wolf, the city's IT department, for his rendition of the national anthem that was played for the first time before the program today. James Richmond, an assistant city attorney, for his contributions of photography and for the video. And Eric Thompson from City Cable 5, pulling all the audio and images together into a video. The national anthem is available on the city's Vimeo page for use by any community group. And finally, I'd also like to invite Melissa Halverson and Megan Perkins to the stage for a special presentation. You heard Melissa's story a few moments ago. Her grit, and her determination, her willingness to embrace a new challenge is inspiring and something we can all learn from. Thank you again for sharing your story and for being a role model for others in our community. Some of you may also have noticed a tremendously talented local artist with us today. Megan has spent the last year sketching and painting scenes from around Spokane as a part of her Artist Eye on Spokane project. 
Her work appeared today throughout our discussion and is featured on the handouts at your tables. You will also find a little bit of information about Megan and her work on your table. Megan has also been quietly helping us paint a picture of our story to bring the words we have spoken today to life. I'd like to present Melissa and Megan with the mayor's coin in recognition of their contribution to our great city. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate it. It's been great. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice job. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you both for joining today. A full portfolio of Megan's work can be seen on Facebook and Instagram under the name Artist Eye on Spokane or her website, MeganPerkinsArt.com. Melissa's work, it'll be on display in buildings all over the city and beyond. Please give Melissa and Megan one more round of applause. They are the kind of stories we love about Spokane. They inspire, they remind, and they energize us. Spokane has so much to offer, and we really are creative by nature. We have spent the past several minutes now talking and thinking about our story of natural beauty and sustainability, opportunity and partnerships, healthcare and education, community and neighborhood. Today is just the start of retelling that story. We sincerely hope that our work will help amplify your work and help us make the sum of Spokane's parts greater than the whole. I want to leave you today with one final look at the story of collaboration, connectivity, and community before I take a few questions. <laughs>